Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. Chapter Three. While leading the way upstairs, she recommended that I should hide the candle and not make a noise, for her master had an odd notion about the chamber she would put me in, and never let anybody lodge there willingly. I asked the reason. She did not know, she answered. She had only lived there a year or two, and they had so many queer goings on she could not begin to be curious. Too stupefied to be curious myself, I fastened my door and glanced round for the bed. The whole furniture consisted of a chair, a clothes press, and a large oak case, with squares cut out near the top resembling coach windows. Having approached this structure, I looked inside and perceived it to be a singular sort of old-fashioned couch, very conveniently designed to obviate the necessity for every member of the family having a room to himself. In fact, it formed a little closet, and the ledge of a window, which it enclosed, served as a table. I slid back the panelled sides, got in with my light, pulled them together again, and felt secure against the vigilance of Heathcliff and every one else. The ledge where I placed my candle had a few mildewed books piled up in one corner, and it was covered with writing scratched on the paint. This writing, however, was nothing but a name repeated in all kinds of characters, large and small. Catherine Earnshaw. Here and there varied to Catherine Heathcliff, and then again to Catherine Linton. In vapid listlessness I leant my head against the window, and continued spelling over Catherine Earnshaw, Heathcliff, Linton, till my eyes closed. But they had not rested five minutes when a glare of white letters started from the dark, as vivid as spectres. The air swarmed with Catherines, and, rousing myself to dispel the obtrusive name, I discovered my candlewick reclining on one of the antique volumes, and perfuming the place with an odour of roasted calf-skin. I snuffed it off, and, very ill at ease under the influence of cold and lingering nausea, sat up and spread open the injured tome on my knee. It was a testament in lean type, and smelling dreadfully musty. A fly-leaf bore the inscription, Catherine Earnshaw, her book, and a date some quarter of a century back. I shut it, and took up another and another, till I had examined all. Catherine's library was select, and its state of dilapidation proved it to have been well used, though not altogether for a legitimate purpose. Scarcely one chapter had escaped a pen-and-ink commentary, at least the appearance of one, covering every morsel of blank that the printer had left. Some were detached sentences. Other parts took the form of a regular diary, scrawled in an unformed childish hand. At the top of an extra page— quite a treasure, probably, when first lighted on, I was greatly amused to behold an excellent caricature of my friend Joseph, rudely yet powerfully sketched. An immediate interest kindled within me for the unknown Catherine, and I began forthwith to decipher her faded hieroglyphics. "'An awful Sunday,' commenced the paragraph beneath. I wish my father were back again. Hindley is a detestable substitute. His conduct to Heathcliff is atrocious. H and I are going to rebel. We took our initiatory step this evening. All day had been flooding with rain. We could not go to church, so Joseph must needs get up a congregation in the garret and while Hindley and his wife basked downstairs before a comfortable fire, doing anything but reading their Bibles, I'll answer for it, Heathcliff, myself, and the unhappy ploughboy were commanded to take our prayer-books and mount. We were ranged in a row, 
on a sack of corn, groaning and shivering, and hoping that Joseph would shiver too, so that he might give us a short homily for his own sake. A vain idea! The service lasted precisely three hours, and yet my brother had the face to exclaim, when he saw us descending, "'What, done already?' "'On Sunday evenings we used to be permitted to play, if we did not make much noise. Now a mere titter is sufficient to send us into corners.' "'You forget you have a master here,' says the tyrant. "'I'll demolish the first who puts me out of temper. I insist on perfect sobriety and silence.' "'Oh, boy, was that you? "'Francis, darling, pull his hair as you go by. "'I heard him snap his fingers.' "'Francis pulled his hair heartily, "'and then went and seated herself on her husband's knee, "'and there they were like two babies, "'kissing and talking nonsense by the hour, "'foolish palaver that we should be ashamed of. "'We made ourselves as snug as our means allowed "'in the arch of the dresser.' I had just fastened our pinafores together, and hung them up for a curtain, when in comes Joseph on an errand from the stables. He tears down my handiwork, boxes my ears, and croaks, "'To Maester Nobbert just buried, and Sabbath not o'er'd, and to sound at a gospel still in your looks, and ye darby laking. Shame on ye! Sit ye down, ill childer. There's good books enough if ye'll read em. "'Sit ye down, and think of your souls.' "'Saying this, he compelled us so to square our positions "'that we might receive from the far-off fire a dull ray "'to show us the text of the lumber he thrust upon us. "'I could not bear the employment. "'I took my dingy volume by the scroop "'and hurled it into the dog-kennel, "'vowing I hated a good book. "'Heathcliff kicked his to the same place.' "'Then there was a hubbub. "'Master Hindley!' shouted our chaplain. "'Master, come either. "'Miss Cathy's riven the back off the helmet of salvation. "'On Heathcliff's paused his fit into first part of the broad way to destruction. "'It's fair flaysome that you let em go on this gate. "'Eh, hey, the old man would a laced em properly, but he's gone.' Hindley hurried up from his paradise on the hearth, and, seizing one of us by the collar and the other by the arm, hurled both into the back kitchen, where, Joseph asseverated, old Nick would fetch us as sure as we were living. And so comforted, we each sought a separate nook to await his advent. I reached this book and a pot of ink from a shelf, and pushed the house-door ajar to give me light and I have got the time on with writing for twenty minutes. But my companion is impatient, and proposes that we should appropriate the dairywoman's cloak, and have a scamper on the moors under its shelter. A pleasant suggestion, and then, if the surly old man come in, he may believe his prophecy verified. We cannot be damper or colder in the rain than we are here. I suppose Catherine fulfilled her project, for the next sentence took up another subject. She waxed lachrymose. "'How little did I dream that Hindley would ever make me cry so,' she wrote. "'My head aches till I cannot keep it on the pillow, and still I can't give over. Poor Heathcliff! Hindley calls him a vagabond, and won't let him sit with us nor eat with us any more.' and he says he and I must not play together, and threatens to turn him out of the house if we break his orders. He has been blaming our father, how dared he, for treating H. too liberally, and swears he will reduce him to his right place. I began to nod drowsily over the dim page. My eye wandered from manuscript to print. I saw a red ornamented title, Seventy Times Seven and the First of the Seventy-First, A Pious Discourse Delivered by the Reverend Jabez Branderham in the Chapel of Gimmerden Suff. And while I was, half-consciously, 
worrying my brain to guess what Jabez Branderham would make of his subject, I sank back in bed and fell asleep. Alas, for the effect of bad tea and bad temper! What else could it be that made me pass such a terrible night? I don't remember another that I can at all compare with it since I was capable of suffering. I began to dream almost before I ceased to be sensible of my locality. I thought it was morning, and I had set out on my way home with Joseph for a guide. The snow lay yards deep in our road, and as we floundered on my companion wearied me with constant reproaches that I had not brought a pilgrim's staff, telling me that I could never get into the house without one, and boastfully flourishing a heavy-headed cudgel which I understood to be so denominated. For a moment I considered it absurd that I should need such a weapon to gain admittance into my own residence. Then a new idea flashed across me. I was not going there. We were journeying to hear the famous Jabez Branderham preach, from the text seventy times seven, and either Joseph, the preacher, or I— had committed the first of the seventy-first, and were to be publicly exposed and excommunicated. We came to the chapel. I have passed it, really, in my walks, twice or thrice. It lies in a hollow between two hills, an elevated hollow near a swamp, whose peaty moisture is said to answer all the purposes of embalming on the few corpses deposited there. The roof has been kept whole hitherto, but as the clergyman's stipend is only twenty pounds per annum and a house with two rooms, threatening speedily to determine into one, no clergyman will undertake the duties of pastor, especially as it is currently reported that his flock would rather let him starve than increase the living by one penny from their own pockets. However, in my dream Jabez had a full and attentive congregation— and he preached, good God, what a sermon! Divided into four hundred and ninety parts, each fully equal to an ordinary address from the pulpit, and each discussing a separate sin. Where he searched for them I cannot tell. He had his private manner of interpreting the phrase, and it seemed necessary the brother should sin different sins on every occasion. They were of the most curious character, odd transgressions that I never imagined previously. Oh, how weary I grew! How I writhed and yawned and nodded and revived! How I pinched and pricked myself, and rubbed my eyes, and stood up, and sat down again! and nudged Joseph to inform me if he would ever have done. I was condemned to hear all out. Finally, he reached the first of the seventy-first. At that crisis a sudden inspiration descended on me. I was moved to rise and denounce Jabez Branderham as the sinner of the sin that no Christian need pardon. "'Sir,' I exclaimed, "'sitting here within these four walls at one stretch, I have endured and forgiven the four hundred and ninety heads of your discourse. Seventy times seven times have I plucked up my hat and been about to depart. Seventy times seven times have you preposterously forced me to resume my seat? The four hundred and ninety-first is too much. Fellow martyrs, have at him! Drag him down and crush him to atoms, that the place which knows him may know him no more. Thou art the man, cried Jabez, after a solemn pause, leaning over his cushion. Seventy times, seven times, didst thou gapingly contort thy visage. 
Seventy times seven did I take counsel with my soul. Lo, this is human weakness, this also may be absolved. The first of the seventy-first is come. Brethren, execute upon him the judgment written. Such honour have all his saints. With that concluding word, the whole assembly, exalting their pilgrim staves, rushed round me in a body, and I, having no weapon to raise in self-defence, commenced grappling with Joseph, my nearest and most ferocious assailant, for his. In the confluence of the multitude several clubs crossed. Blows aimed at me fell on other sconces. Presently the whole chapel resounded with rappings and counter-rappings. Every man's hand was against his neighbour, and Branderham, unwilling to remain idle, poured forth his zeal in a shower of loud taps on the boards of the pulpit, which responded so smartly that, at last, to my unspeakable relief, they woke me. And what was it that had suggested the tremendous tumult? What had played Jabez's part in the row? Merely the branch of a fir-tree that touched my lattice as the blast wailed by and rattled its dry cones against the panes. I listened doubtingly an instant, detected the disturber, then turned and dozed, and dreamt again, if possible, still more disagreeably than before. This time I remembered I was lying in the oak closet, and I heard distinctly the gusty wind and the driving of the snow. I heard also the fir-bough repeat its teasing sound, and ascribed it to the right cause. But it annoyed me so much that I resolved to silence it, if possible. And, I thought, I rose and endeavoured to unhasp the casement. The hook was soldered into the staple a circumstance observed by me when awake, but forgotten. "'I must stop it, nevertheless,' I muttered, knocking my knuckles through the glass, and stretching an arm out to seize the importunate branch. Instead of which, my fingers closed on the fingers of a little ice-cold hand. The intense horror of nightmare came over me. I tried to draw back my arm, but the hand clung to it, and a most melancholy voice sobbed, "'Let me in! Let me in!' "'Who are you?' I asked, struggling, meanwhile, to disengage myself. "'Catherine Linton!' it replied shiveringly. Why did I think of Linton? I had read Earnshaw twenty times for Linton.' Home. I lost my way on the moor. As it spoke, I discerned obscurely a child's face looking through the window. Terror made me cruel, and finding it useless to attempt shaking the creature off, I pulled its wrist onto the broken pane, and rubbed it to and fro till the blood ran down and soaked the bedclothes. Still it wailed. Let me in, and maintained its tenacious grip, almost maddening me with fear. How can I? I said at length. Let me go if you want me to let you in. The fingers relaxed. I snatched mine through the hole, hurriedly piled the books up in a pyramid against it, and stopped my ears to exclude the lamentable prayer. I seemed to keep them closed above a quarter of an hour, yet the instant I listened again there was the doleful cry moaning on. "'Be gone!' I shouted. "'I'll never let you in, not if you beg for twenty years!' "'It is twenty years!' mourned the voice. Twenty years!' I've been away for twenty years. Thereat began a feeble scratching outside. 
and the pile of books moved as if thrust forward. I tried to jump up, but could not stir a limb, and so yelled aloud in a frenzy of fright. To my confusion I discovered the yell was not ideal. Hasty footsteps approached my chamber door. Somebody pushed it open with a vigorous hand, and a light glimmered through the squares at the top of the bed. I sat, shuddering yet, and wiping the perspiration from my forehead. The intruder appeared to hesitate, and muttered to himself. At last he said in a half-whisper, plainly not expecting an answer, "'Is any one here?' I considered it best to confess my presence, for I knew Heathcliff's accents, and feared he might search further if I kept quiet. With this intention I turned and opened the panels. I shall not soon forget the effect my action produced. Heathcliff stood near the entrance, in his shirt and trousers, with a candle dripping over his fingers, and his face as white as the wall behind him. The first creak of the oak startled him like an electric shock. The light leapt from his hold to a distance of some feet, and his agitation was so extreme that he could hardly pick it up. "'It is only your guest, sir,' I called out, desirous to spare him the humiliation of exposing his cowardice further. I had the misfortune to scream in my sleep, owing to a frightful nightmare. I'm sorry I disturbed you. "'Oh, God confound you, Mr. Lockwood! I wish you were at the—' commenced my host, setting the candle on a chair, because he found it impossible to hold it steady. "'And who showed you up into this room?' he continued, crushing his nails into his palms, and grinding his teeth to subdue the maxillary convulsions. "'Who was it? I've a good mind to turn them out of the house this moment!' "'It was your servant, Zilla,' I replied, flinging myself onto the floor, and rapidly resuming my garments. "'I should not care if you did, Mr. Heathcliff. She richly deserves it. I suppose that she wanted to get another proof that the place was haunted, at my expense. Well, it is— "'Swarming with ghosts and goblins! "'You have reason in shutting it up, I assure you. "'No one will thank you for a doze in such a den.' "'What do you mean?' asked Heathcliff. "'And what are you doing? "'Lie down and finish out the night, since you are here. "'But for heaven's sake, don't repeat that horrid noise. "'Nothing could excuse it, unless you are having your throat cut.' "'If the little fiend had got in at the window, she probably would have strangled me,' I returned. "'I'm not going to endure the persecutions of your hospitable ancestors again. Was not the Reverend Jabez Brandram akin to you on the mother's side? And that minx Catherine Linton, or Earnshaw, or however she was called, she must have been a changeling, wicked little soul. She told me she had been walking the earth these twenty years.' "'a just punishment for her mortal transgressions, I've no doubt.' "'Scarcely were these words uttered "'when I recollected the association of Heathcliff's "'with Catherine's name in the book, "'which had completely slipped from my memory till thus awakened. "'I blushed at my inconsideration, "'but without showing further consciousness of the offence, "'I hastened to add, "'The truth is, sir, I passed the first part of the night in—' Here I stopped afresh. I was about to say, perusing those old volumes. Then it would have revealed my knowledge of their written, as well as their printed contents. So, correcting myself, I went on, in spelling over the name scratched on that window-ledge, a monotonous occupation calculated to set me asleep, like counting, or— what? "'Can you mean by talking in this way to me?' thundered Heathcliff, with savage vehemence. "'How, how dare you, under my roof? God, he's mad to speak so!' And he struck his forehead with rage. 
I did not know whether to resent this language or pursue my explanation, but he seemed so powerfully affected that I took pity, and proceeded with my dreams, affirming I had never heard the appellation of Catherine Linton before, but reading it often over produced an impression which personified itself when I had no longer my imagination under control. Heathcliff gradually fell back into the shelter of the bed as I spoke, finally sitting down almost concealed behind it. I guessed, however, by his irregular and intercepted breathing, that he struggled to vanquish an excess of violent emotion. Not liking to show him that I had heard the conflict, I continued my toilet rather noisily, looked at my watch, and soliloquised on the length of the night. Not three o'clock yet. I could have taken oath it had been six. Time stagnates here. We must surely have retired to rest at eight. Always at nine in winter, and rise at four, said my host, suppressing a groan, and, as I fancied, by the motion of his arm's shadow, dashing a tear from his eyes. Mr. Lockwood, he added, you may go into my room. You'll only be in the way, coming downstairs so early, and your childish outcry has sent sleep to the devil for me. And for me, too, I replied. I'll walk in the yard till daylight, and then I'll be off. And you need not dread a repetition of my intrusion. I'm now quite cured of seeking pleasure in society, be it country or town. A sensible man ought to find sufficient company in himself. Delightful company, muttered Heathcliff. "'Take the candle and go where you please. "'I shall join you directly. "'Keep out of the yard, though, the dogs are unchained, "'and the house—Juno mounts sentinel there. "'And, nay, you can only ramble about the steps and passages. "'But away with you. "'I'll come in two minutes.' "'I obeyed so far as to quit the chamber, "'when, ignorant where the narrow lobbies led, "'I stood still, and was witness involuntarily— to a piece of superstition on the part of my landlord, which belied oddly his apparent sense. He got on to the bed, and wrenched open the lattice, bursting, as he pulled at it, into an uncontrollable passion of tears. "'Come in! Come in!' he sobbed. "'Cathy, do come! Oh, do!' Once more. Oh, my heart, darling, hear me this time, Catherine, at last. The spectre showed a spectre's ordinary caprice. It gave no sign of being, but the snow and wind whirled wildly through, even reaching my station and blowing out the light. There was such anguish in the gush of grief that accompanied this raving, that my compassion made me overlook its folly, and I drew off, half angry to have listened at all, and vexed at having related my ridiculous nightmare, since it produced that agony, though why was beyond my comprehension. I descended cautiously to the lower regions, and landed in the back kitchen, where a gleam of fire, raked compactly together, enabled me to rekindle my candle. Nothing was stirring except a brindled grey cat, which crept from the ashes, and saluted me with a querulous mew. Two benches shaped in sections of a circle nearly enclosed the hearth. On one of these I stretched myself, and Grimalkin mounted the other. We were both of us nodding ere any one invaded our retreat, and then it was Joseph, shuffling down a wooden ladder that vanished in the roof through a trap, the ascent to his garret, I suppose. He cast a sinister look at the little flame which I had enticed to play between the ribs, swept the cat from its elevation, and, bestowing himself in the vacancy, commenced the operation of stuffing a three-inch pipe with tobacco. My presence in his sanctum was evidently esteemed a piece of impudence too shameful for remark. 
he silently applied the tube to his lips, folded his arms, and puffed away. I let him enjoy the luxury unannoyed, and after sucking out his last wreath, and heaving a profound sigh, he got up and departed as solemnly as he came. A more elastic footstep entered next, and now I opened my mouth for a good morning, but closed it again, the salutation unachieved, for Hareton Earnshaw was performing his orison sotto voce in a series of curses directed against every object he touched, while he rummaged a corner for a spade or shovel to dig through the drifts. He glanced over the back of the bench, dilating his nostrils, and thought as little of exchanging civilities with me as with my companion, the cat. I guessed by his preparations that egress was allowed, and, leaving my hard couch, made a movement to follow him. He noticed this, and thrust at an inner door with the end of his spade, intimating by an inarticulate sound that there was the place where I must go if I changed my locality. It opened into the house where the females were already astir, Zilla urging flakes of flame up the chimney with a colossal bellows, and Mrs. Heathcliff, kneeling on the hearth, reading a book by the aid of the blaze. She held her hand interposed between the furnace-heat and her eyes, and seemed absorbed in her occupation, desisting from it only to chide the servant for covering her with sparks, or to push away a dog now and then that snoozled its nose over forwardly into her face. I was surprised to see Heathcliff there also. He stood by the fire, his back towards me, just finishing a stormy scene with poor Zilla, who ever and anon interrupted her labour to pluck up the corner of her apron and heave an indignant groan. "'And you, you worthless!' he broke out as I entered, turning to his daughter-in-law, and employing an epithet as harmless as duck or sheep but generally represented by a dash. "'There you are at your idle tricks again. The rest of them do earn their bread. You live on my charity. Put your trash away and find something to do. You shall pay me for the plague of having you eternally in my sight. Do you hear, damnable jade?' "'I'll put my trash away, because you can make me if I refuse,' answered the young lady closing her book and throwing it on a chair. "'But I'll not do anything, though you should swear your tongue out, except what I please.' Heathcliff lifted his hand, and the speaker sprang to a safer distance, obviously acquainted with its weight. Having no desire to be entertained by a cat-and-dog combat, I stepped forward briskly, as if eager to partake the warmth of the hearth and innocent of any knowledge of the interrupted dispute. Each had enough decorum to suspend further hostilities. Heathcliff placed his fists out of temptation in his pockets. Mrs. Heathcliff curled her lip, and walked to a seat far off, where she kept her word by playing the part of a statue during the remainder of my stay. That was not long. I declined joining their breakfast, and at the first gleam of dawn took an opportunity of escaping into the free air, now clear and still, and cold as impalpable ice. My landlord hallooed for me to stop ere I reached the bottom of the garden, and offered to accompany me across the moor. It was well he did, for the whole hill-back was one billowy white ocean, the swells and falls not indicating corresponding rises and depressions in the ground. Many pits, at least, were filled to a level, and entire ranges of mounds, the refuse of the quarries, blotted from the chart which my yesterday's walk left pictured in my mind. I had remarked on one side of the road, at intervals of six or seven yards, a line of upright stones, continued through the whole length of the barren, these were erected and daubed with lime on purpose to serve as guides in the dark, and also, when a fall, like the present, confounded the deep swamps on either hand with the firmer path. 
but except a dirty dot pointing up here and there, all traces of their existence had vanished, and my companion found it necessary to warn me frequently to steer to the right or left, when I imagined I was following correctly the windings of the road. We exchanged little conversation, and he halted at the entrance of Thrushcross Park, saying I could make no error there. Our adieu were limited to a hasty bow, and then I pushed forward, trusting to my own resources, for the porter's lodge is untenanted as yet. The distance from the gate to the Grange is two miles. I believe I managed to make it four, what with losing myself among the trees, and sinking up to the neck in snow, a predicament which only those who have experienced it can appreciate. At any rate, whatever were my wanderings, the clock chimed twelve as I entered the house, and that gave exactly an hour for every mile of the usual way from Wuthering Heights. My human fixture and her satellites rushed to welcome me, exclaiming tumultuously they had completely given me up. Everybody conjectured that I perished last night, and they were wondering how they must set about the search for my remains. I bid them be quiet now that they saw me returned, and, benumbed to my very heart, I dragged upstairs, whence, after putting on dry clothes, and pacing to and fro thirty or forty minutes to restore the animal heat, I adjourned to my study, feeble as a kitten, almost too much so to enjoy the cheerful fire and smoking coffee which the servant had prepared for my refreshment. End of chapter 3 Recording by Ruth Golding